Let's now discuss the last two topics of our mathematical preliminaries. These are differential equations, restricting our interest only to linear first-order equations, and the second is the numerical solutions of those equations. So, using a computer to solve numerically those equations and not, say, uh, paper and pen like we are going to approach, at least in this part. I would like to make a digression first, leveraging on your existing knowledge of some other kind of equations, the algebraic equation, for instance. And I would like to point out that whenever I might say equations, in your, in your head, maybe you are thinking of something like this. There is a mathematical expression, and then a sign of equal, and then, say, zero, or any other number. It's interesting, it's intriguing uh, to me to discover that it is since the 16th century, through the work of uh, a British mathematician and physician, Robert Record, that we're now using the symbol equals, equal to indicate uh, a mathematical equivalence and an equation. So if you don't like equations, so please, you know now who to blame. This is basically corresponding to a statement, and it is, can be read aloud in the following way. Is there one or more, or maybe no, numbers x, so that f of x is equal to zero? Before giving you example of what you probably already know, I would like to give first a brief refresher on the so-called graphical solution of an equation. If f of x is uh, just these function depicted here in blue in the lower left part of the slide, f of x equals to zero corresponds to finding the intersection of this curve with the horizontal axis, which is indeed corresponding to the uh, vertical coordinate equals to zero. And in this particular case, there are two solutions. Examples of algebraic and non-algebraic equations are provided uh, now. x plus 5 equal to 0, a times x squared plus bx plus c equals to 0. These are algebraic equations, and let me read it aloud. Does exist a value and a single number or more than one number, x, such that x plus 5 is equal to 0? Well, regardless of ways and techniques to solve this equation that you probably have learned uh, from the primary school or at the high school, if x is replaced by minus 5, then you have minus 5 plus 5 equal to 0, so the left-hand side and the right-hand side are equal, so you satisfy the equation. For the second-order algebraic equation, you might remember and you better refresh the elementary expression describing the two, if they exist, two real numbers that are satisfying these equations. There are other examples of uh, non-algebraic equations, like the one indicated here, log of x minus 0.5 times x equals minus 0.5, and this other one, square of x minus sine of 1 divided by x equals to 0. The concept is is there one number, or maybe more than one number, or no number, such that when you plug it here in this equation, you get a satisfaction 0 equals to 0? And I invite you, perhaps, to play with these equations and to find whether or not, say, this formula works, and just by plotting the functions that are indicated here. Let's go to ordinary differential equations. They are a slightly different kind of beast in math. And these are examples. And in this example, the statement that is made is a little bit different than what was for the algebraic equations. Here the question is, is there a function, so not just a single number, but a function, such that the derivative of this function equals, in this case, minus the function itself? So I'm searching not anymore for single numbers, maybe one, maybe multiple, maybe none, but relationship between two sets, or if you want, graphs of functions that are satisfying this property in this particular case. Let me give you other examples. The derivative of f is equals to twice the function f itself. Or the derivative of f is equals to 1 divided by x. 
or other a little bit more complicated differential equations. They're called differential because the unknown is a function and because the sign of derivative is appearing. It's not any more conventional mathematical operation like square root, sine, cosine, exponential, etc. But you actually have derivatives. In this case, it's a first order derivative. It's a first derivative, therefore, the equation is called first order. And it's called ordinary because this sign of derivative is the ordinary uh, derivative that I introduced you, that I refreshed in the earlier part of this module. So, beyond the techniques to solve these equations that can be very easy, as the one that we will examine, or very complicated, the concept is. Is there a function that if I plug here, I get a satisfaction for this equation, zero, or say, left-hand side equals to the right-hand side? And I remind you some possible functions. And of course, it's implicit that all the possible combinations of this function would still be candidate as potential solution for this equation. Let me take this one. It's a constant function, and the value of this function is minus 41 everywhere. I plug it here and the derivative is 0, and then I remain in the left-hand side with 0 equals plus 41. Well, this does not satisfy the equation. Hmm. I may try this one, sine of x, I plug it here. Well, the derivative is cosine of x, and on the right-hand side is minus sine of x, so once more, hmm, doesn't work. You will see that if you take this particular one, and I leave it to you as an exercise, and you plug it here, the exponential of minus x would satisfy this equation. So in the most general case that we are not going to examine, you have that the unknown of this equation is a function, and sometimes it is um, isolated as a first derivative through the left-hand side of the equation, and on the right-hand side of the equation you have a complex, potentially complex, highly nonlinear combination of mathematical operations where the unknown f of x is appearing here, so here it's squared, here it's under the sign, under the sign, and then under the sign of square root, but also the independent variable of the function itself is appearing. So sometimes you might see, and in the course we might use this very concise notation of having, say, a big g for referring to a complex function where the, if you want, the independent variable is f. And if you really want to be very precise, you can say, well, this is also a function, particularly this one in, in the example. This right-hand side features f of x, but also x itself independently like this. So it might become an explicit dependence on f and on x. But let's focus on just one single ordinary differential equation that you must absolutely study. And I will call you throughout the course the usual differential equation, or the boring differential equation, just to emphasize it's always the same that will come over and over, so it's very important. So it is of this particular uh, type. Derivative of f is equal to constant a times f, and a is a constant. It can be positive or negative, we will see the consequence for that. It's called first order because only the first derivative appears, as already discussed. It's called with constant coefficients, because yes, there is just one factor here, and this factor is constant. It's not depending on x, it's not a function of x, it's just a constant with respect to x. And it's also called homogeneous, because here there is no other uh, term in the right-hand side uh, with the exception of f. There is nothing here added. So what kind of solution this equation could have? I read it, the statement aloud. There is a function f such that the derivative is equal to the function itself, apart from a factor a. Well, in principle, you should take all the functions that you know and their combination and concatenation, plug them here and here, so take the derivative and then multiply the function itself by a, and see whether it's possible, whether you would find a solution, a satisfaction for this equation. You could be lucky if maybe trying with the exponential function, because the exponential function has an interesting property. When you take the, its derivative, you get the function itself. So the derivative of exponential of x is exponential of x. Well, here it's a little bit different. So if a was 1, this would be, the equation would be satisfied. 
So you might be very close to the right uh, solution. And just by this brute force approach, you could find that any function of the type constant, say k can be 32 or minus 5 or 0 or 25 times the exponential of a times x is satisfying this relationship, this equation. Let me just try. I take this and I plug it here. So I take the first derivative and according to the rules that I refreshed earlier, you get k a times the exponential of a times x, which is exactly what you would get taking f of x here and plugging it here in the right hand side. It multiplies a. So this equation is satisfied. This is a solution. It is actually a family of solution because here I didn't have to specify the value of this constant k. It can be anything. So strictly speaking, this has an infinite number of, uh, of solutions. Let me try to be more precise, defining the only ordinary differential equation that you must study and remember. It is the same as, as above, but with an initial condition. So a condition that specified that out of the possible infinite family of solutions, I would like to find one that passes through a specific point. So at x0 coordinate, it takes the value f0. Now, to identify the specific value of the constant k such that the solution calculated in x0 is equal to f0 is a kind of conventional equation. It's not algebraic. Well, it is algebraic. So you might try to do it by yourself. And if you do so, you discover that the uh, constant k takes the form f0 times the exponential of minus a times x0. Note that this is just a number because x0 is just one number. So it's the exponential calculated in one point. It's one number. And you can also rewrite it in this way, remembering that the product of the exponential is the exponential of the sum. And this form will get more and more frequently used in the following. So in the general case, I already basically anticipated invoking some heuristics, some similarities of the rules with the rules of derivatives. And I already provided you one solution for this equation. Now, the equation plus the initial condition in mathematics is called a Cauchy problem. And there is a mathematical theorem that ensures that answers to these questions. Is the solution existing? Is it just a single or there are multiple solutions? These have just a, a unitary answer. Yes, the solution exists and it is unique. There is just one. Let me explain you briefly why bothering with ordinary differential equation. And I will read this because it's very important. It's a statement that is very important. In biophysics, that specific ordinary differential equation that we are going to call the usual or boring differential equation explains or approximates many phenomena. And this is the case for the law of physics. In general, they are easily expressed in terms of rate of change of quantities. And if you want to get to the quantity, you might have to solve a differential equation. And in the particular case of the homogeneous differential equation that I showed you, they are generally approximating phenomena that are occurring spontaneously, as a function of time, say, without any external driving force. And it's interesting because if you know how to solve a differential equation and you end up with a function that is the solution of it, you can evaluate the function, in this case, say it's a function of time, for any value of the independent variable. So, for instance, you can plug as independent variable the time of a future time, say 1st of January 2239. Most likely, we will be all dead by that time Yet, you will be able to make a prediction of what would be, say, of your physical phenomena or your favorite experiment, what would happen at that moment in time. The specific class of equations that I'm pushing you to study and learn are appearing in a variety of cases, and I'm just listing here the most important. The voltage across a capacitor, so the electrical phenomena, ex making explicit in terms of electrical voltage across the capacitor, during this charging is satisfying the same ordinary differential equation, which is also the very same differential equation that the temperature of an object, which is exchanging heat with its environment by thermal conduction as opposed to convection or irradiation, is satisfying. 
or it's the same equation that you would write if studying the level of water in a tank or in a pool with a leak, say there is a hole at the bottom of the pool. Or, more interesting for our case, maybe how the concentration of a substance in a given point would change in time spontaneously without any additional external driving force. Or how specifically maybe a specific kind of ions, say sodium ions, which are very relevant for nerve impulse, are exchanged or might be exchanged across the biological membrane of a nerve cell. And finally, how electrical properties, electrical phenomena characterizing the cellular excitability would be changing in time, for instance, across cell membranes of neurons by satisfying exactly the same differential equation. So it's not an abstract mathematical exercise. Let me summarize the solution of these usual, boring, ordinary differential equation that I think you already start loathing. The solution is the, an exponential function, which is, well, scaled by a factor f0, which is the initial condition, and shifted towards the right or the left, depending on the value x0. And there is also a scaling parameter a that makes the exponential uh, transient to be faster or, or slower. Let me plot it to you for a equals uh, a positive value, in this case it's 0.7, or a negative value, in this case it was minus 0.7. So you see something interesting that you should try to remember, and it's actually quite easy to remember. If a in this differential equation is positive, you have that the solution will explode, will increase in the direction of increasing x. Say x represents time, as the time goes by, the quantities will become very quickly, immensely large. You remember these exponential growth? That's exactly the things I'm talking about. On the other hand, when A is negative, so when here there is something with a minus, so the, the prefactor is negative, you have a decay, a progressive decay, and an exhausting of what I will call in the course transient. At some point, the function, the solution will be zero. Whenever I inspect a differential equation, although this is not a general rule, I always again look at the sign of this uh, constant. If this is negative, I'm kind of happy that I wrote it, maybe I wrote it by heart or whatever, I did it right, because in biology and in, uh, real, in the real world, things are not usually exploding. Whereas when A is positive, maybe there is something suspicious as the quantities will just become immensely large. This has uh, something to do with, the, uh, with thermodynamics and with the fact that most of the physical systems are dissipative. So they might dissipate energy and so you may not have some kind of positive feedback and then some kind of self-sustaining and growing excitation or growing ex explosive force. As I said, there are exceptions for this and uh, I will comment on that during the course. For the moment, please remember the difference when A is positive explosive when A is negative, you have progressive exhaustion of the phenomenon and convergence to zero.